Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy November 1st. We're glad you're here. Whether you're physically here or online, we're glad that you're tuning in, or hopefully, yes, our brains are tuning in no matter where we are today. And I'd like to start with a quick prayer. Lord, I thank you for the ability to meet physically and the technology that you provide so that people can hear your word all around the world. Lord, we pray that your word spread like wildfire, that even through something that as simple as a phone, that your word causes revival in this country. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been in the book of Mark for quite a while. Oh, that's right. I usually start with a discussion question. So obviously yesterday was Halloween. I had somebody tell me Happy Thanksgiving. But yesterday was Halloween. And what, well, maybe it's something you saw that was your favorite costume, or maybe sometime you've dressed up as something. And what was your favorite costume that you've either seen or you were? And you can answer here, and I always look back online to see who answers on on our live stream. So let's hear it. Who had a good costume or saw a good costume? Well, I saw him for more than he did, and a little fancy girls. That's my favorite. Yeah, nice. And guys when they're dressed up fancy, not everything. Anybody else? Rod, do you dress up? No. No. <laughs> One year, Cheryl was Jane Goodall, and I had my gorilla costume, and I was her ape. <laughs> I've been a uh, zombie with full green makeup and everything, and um, I was a uh, skeleton, a cowboy skeleton one time, and like went to a church party, and yeah, I got asked not to dress like that anymore. <laughs> But I love seeing the costumes. Last night I actually put on a bacon costume, my bacon strip, and stood outside dancing and giving out candy to whoever came by out on the corner so that people could see and see activity with the church. And we got to meet some people. We had a good time. Good enough, though. Tim, do you dress up? No, I'm not. No? Okay. Well... You guys are no fun, but I saw we saw the cutest little bumblebee too. Little kid, didn't, I don't think he spoke any English. I had to tell him uh, cinco for how many pieces. Or no, that's what it was. They took one piece, and I said, uh, I asked, I said, mas, mas, and so they took more. And it was, but the kid was just adorable. So we've been in the Book of Mark for a while. If you aren't caught up, I suggest reading up to Mark 14. Um, there's been a whole lot of stuff. We've been going through it really slowly. I've really been enjoying it. And we're still in the final week of the physical, earthly life of Jesus. And last week we talked about how Jesus was in the garden and James, John, and Peter fell asleep when he, they were supposed to be with Jesus just a short distance away. They should have been praying. Jesus said, watch and pray. And they took a nap three different times. And so that's where we're picking up. The last thing he said when he came and saw them sleeping for the third time was, are you still sleeping? Enough. This is enough. Let's do this, basically. Here comes my betrayer. And we're picking up in Mark 14, verses 43 through 52. So here we go. And immediately, after he said, enough, here comes my betrayer, my betrayer is on his way. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. We're going to stop there for a minute. We're going to take an interesting approach today. We're going to look at a situation that several people experience and look at six key players and how they responded to this experience. So we're going to start with Judas because that's the one we just talked about. Judas, the one of the twelve. He is the betrayer. So in verse 44, now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. 
seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come immediately, he went to him and said to him, Rabbi, ra Rabbi, and kissed him, uh, and, yeah, and kissed him. So, here we go. We got Judas. He's our first key player. And verse 43 describes him as one of the twelve. And it's just not, a not just a throwaway thing, you know, oh yeah, he was one of the twelve, and let's get on to the next point. One of the twelve has a lot of significance, because he wasn't just some dude. So he wasn't just some rando that said, oh yeah, I know who Jesus is, what he looks like, I'll show you who he is. He was one who Jesus had taken under his wing, and invested in, and poured his heart into, and loved, was teaching him, was leading him, was giving him the, th the tools to be equipped to spread the gospel, to be Jesus, the representative of Jesus, to spread his word after Jesus was gone. He loved Judas, one of the 12 that was set apart because there were a whole lot of followers of Christ that were also called disciples. But this was one of the 12 that was the apostles set aside. Jesus gave extra time, poured extra into, gave extra investment. He was one of the 12 that was the special people that Jesus set out to minister to the world. And he had given them, he said to them, I give you authority to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. One of the 12 that Jesus trusted, that's who Jesus, uh, Judas was. And you probably are wondering, well, why did they have to have somebody show them who Jesus was? Because, I mean, Jesus was a pretty popular guy by now. By now, people were starting to know who he was, but you have to put yourself into the situation. Back then, there was no electricity. They didn't have a light in the garden. They didn't have a fancy ring light like I have so that it makes my face look really good on camera. They didn't have these kind of things. They had a bunch of torches. The, the garden was dark. So you had a torchlight that only went for a certain distance, probably just enough to see your footsteps. So that's all they had. They weren't able to possibly, it was easy to mistake some person for another person. They needed an inside man, somebody that knew Jesus, that knew his voice, that knew what he would be wearing, knew, had just seen him, had just spent time with him. And they wanted to make sure that they didn't make a mistake because in the past, Jesus did escape capture back when he was in the temple. They wanted to they wanted to take him away. And there was too many in the crowd. He just sort of slipped in and they weren't able to take him. So Judas said, volunteered. He said, well, I'll show you. I'll give, him, I'll, I'll give you the signal. And the signal was a kiss. And in those days, a kiss was pretty common for a form of greeting. Slaves would kiss the feet of the masters. Inferiors would kiss the hand. Equals kissed on the cheek. So it's not as weird as you might think, like some dude walking up and kissing another guy on the cheek. It was something that was had happened, was common to happen, but you have to catch that. Judas came up and kissed Jesus on the cheek. He was saying, I'm your equal. He stopped recognizing Jesus as the Lord and greeted him, said, Rabbi, Rabbi, not Lord. Because Rabbi could be talking from one rabbi to another. It's like, you know, one pastor to another. Sometimes we call each other pastor. Sometimes it's just calling, you know, hey, Jimmy, or whatever. But he stopped recognizing Jesus as Lord. This is a warning for all of us. If we don't submit to spiritual leadership, bad things can happen. It's dangerous. If we're not submitting to spiritual leadership, we start to elevate ourselves to a position that we probably have not actually any deserving of being at that position yet. We, we stop looking at the teacher, the master, and we, I mean, not that I'm saying the pastor is a master, but he is your spiritual leader. I have a spiritual leader. I have a district supervisor. We have the president of Foursquare. I wouldn't just, you know, say, hey, what's up, dude? Just give him a high five and go on. It, I would probably give a big hug and say, hello, my teacher. 
my, you know, my boss, basically, is what it would be. But Judas immediately kissed Jesus. He didn't have any hesitation. He just, as soon as he saw it, and you know, oh, yep, that's him, gave him a kiss. Didn't think about any kind of regret. And it wasn't just like a peck on the cheek either. This was a kiss of love. It, the Greek explains that it was actually a loving kiss. Not just, that's the guy, let's get over with. He put on this display that he was putting on an act for Jesus. Like, maybe that way they would not, Jesus wouldn't see that it was him that was doing it. They just, yeah, I mean, he just had no regrets, though. He didn't think about the consequences. He didn't think about how it would hurt Jesus. He didn't think about the repercussions. What was going to happen to Jesus after the fact? Even though he said, seize him. And in verse 45, that was the last time that Judas was mentioned in the book of Mark. So what became of Judas? What happened to him after this incident? Well, the book of John tells us that Judas stuck around for a while. He kind of lurked in the background watching things that were happening. He waited and he saw Jesus being condemned. And he went to the leaders and said, I made a mistake. I've, I've betrayed innocent blood. Now, my, I always wonder, was he trying to undo what he had done because he was remorseful? Or was he trying to save his own skin at this point? Oh boy, I really messed up. I... And the Jewish leaders, the people that he had betrayed Jesus to, he gave them the money. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what do we care? What is it to us, is what they actually said. And they had accomplished their goal. They had gotten this Jesus. That they, they were on the steps to putting him to death, to what they thought was going to end this whole Jesus revolution. So Judas then was so full of remorse. He didn't know what to do. And so he hung himself. But he couldn't even get that right. Judas hung himself and we're told that he either the rope snapped or the branch that he hung himself by snapped. And his body fell to the ground. His intestines burst out everywhere, all over the place. Nice Halloween day after Halloween story, right? But there was blood and guts everywhere. And he he still was alive and dying, slow, painful death, excruciating death. That's what happened to Judas. Hmm. And then we have the crowd. Second key player in the story is the crowd. So it's key players, but we're going to lump them all together. So who was this crowd? Who were they led by, first of all? They were members of the Sanhedrin. This was the highest religious group in Jerusalem. This was the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, all these ones that were responsible for making sure that the law was met, that the religious law was met, and the enforcement of it. And there was also at least one representative of the high priest. These should have been the people that were on the same side as Jesus, the ones that actually wanted him to achieve the goal that God had given him. Uh, if they didn't understand even what the goal was. There was also a large contingent of temple pe police. These were the ones that were responsible for making sure that like the unclean didn't get in, the physically unclean weren't able to come in. If you had leprosy, they got you got turned away. If you, whatever the situation, if you were sick, you got turned away if it was something that would possibly cause others to be unclean. Which is another interesting thought because the ones that were responsible for keeping the physically unclean didn't have anything to do with keeping the spiritually unclean out of the place. They actually fed into it. They came right along with the rest of that group. They came in and got in line and did this, leading, leading them and protecting them. They had clubs and swords. There's a large contingent of the temple police and around 600 Roman soldiers. We're told that it was a contingent, or a, I can't remember the word, but basically it was somewhere estimated around 600 Roman soldiers. And now these guys were not, this was a whole group of different people. Like we had the Jews, we had the Romans, we had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, we had the Wycantuses, all these other, all these 
different people, this whole big group of all kinds of people who were not like best friends. They Most of the time they didn't even get along, but they were united in a common misguided purpose, the goal of getting Jesus out of there. An angry mob begins with a few. It didn't start out that this, there was this giant mob that the Bible describes as a multitude. We know there was over 600, probably closer to 800 probably. It didn't start out like that. There was a few people that didn't like what they saw. They didn't like this Jesus guy, this young upstart, changing the way that we've done things forever, changing our traditions, changing what we know that we know and you can't tell us any differently. They started talking amongst each other and then they started talking against him to other people, to anyone that would listen. They started saying things and get this crowd that, okay, well, the Pharisees see this. We have to tell the Sadducees so they can come along with us and agree with us. We have to tell these people. We have to tell these until finally this was this huge group. They used their influence and gained the movement gained traction. And if the few had started out humbly praying, listening to God, where are you leading? I don't even understand, God, where you're leading, but I'm willing to submit. I don't think that it would have stopped what had to have been done, but they would not have been used as agents of the devil. You ever think about that? They wouldn't have been used as agents of the devil. So here they are, this large group, clubs and swords. Why were they carrying clubs and swords? It was Jesus and 11 of his buddies. What? Why does all this group, the, the swords they had were probably about that long. They were for close combat at the time. And why were they doing this? Again, we have to look at the context. Less than a week ago, Jesus had just had his triumphal entry. He came into Jerusalem and people threw their coats on the ground, threw down palm branches, said, glory to him who come in the name of the Lord. Glory to God on the highest. They, these were the people that had seen and witnessed miracles that were in Jerusalem at the time. They were there for the Passover. There were people that from all over had heard the stories about Jesus and come together and heard. And I, I tell you this because I'm excited. And, oh, well, this is what I saw. This is the Jesus that I saw. And they heard him preach with authority. They saw him clear the temple. Because there was probably a whole bunch of them that had shown up at the temple on that Monday. They saw him at the temple. And they had been one of the victims of the oppressed. They had been the ones that the priests were charging extra money and charging for money changing and all of the crazy stuff. These were the people that were celebrating what Jesus had done. Our oppression is over. The religious oppression is over. This is the one that says what the kingdom of God is like. All you need to do is repent, change, and be baptized. So those are the people that the, the group of the angry mob, they were afraid of them because these people might revolt. And I often wonder when, you, when I read this, if when the mob came, all these people with their torch in one hand, their club or their sword in the other hand, coming in, and yeah, let's get them, let's get them, let's get them. And from a distance, Jesus saw this big group and you know, the torch lights when they're all together, look a lot brighter. And Jesus probably thinking, <laughs> that's cute. Because Jesus could call down fire from heaven and wipe them out if he wanted to. That's the Jesus who laid down his life for us. But this group got the signal from Judas. Judas came up, gave him the kiss. Said, Rabbi, Rabbi. Verse 46. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. Laid their hands on him and took him. Verse 44. Judas said, seize him. And that's what other translations say. They seized him. It's not just, okay, come along peacefully. You know, if you don't come along peacefully, we might have to put handcuffs on you. We'd really like you to come along with us, Jesus. No, they seized him. The Greek form of that word means a hostile, violent kidnapping. 
And uh, as often happens, violence begets violence. Verse 47, And one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. The book of John tells us that, that one of them was Peter. Peter had something to prove, right? Because, I mean, just probably an hour ago, Jesus had said, all of you are going to betray me. So Jesus Jesus already told them, this is going to happen. All of you are not betray, I'm sorry, desert me. You're going to be gone. As soon as the hard times come, you're going to be gone. And so Peter, bold, bless his heart, Peter, pulled out a sword. And you know what? Peter is a fisherman. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't a swordsman. He hadn't practiced the arts of art of swordsmanship. He wasn't going just to like, oh, get back. I'm going to cut off your ear if you don't get back. He was trying to cut off this dude's head. He was aiming for the head, and maybe the guy moved. Maybe it was just Peter was a clutch, but he cut off the ear. Peter was trying to decapitate this guy and missed. This is that loud Peter who spoke first and thought later. This impulsive Peter who acted before his brain actually told him what to do. The same Peter who, when he had an opportunity to pray, to join with Jesus where, the way he should have in spiritual battle, slept. Because for this kind of person, like Peter, like often a lot of us, myself included, prayer can sometimes be considered an obligation. I'm certain that if Peter had made the choice to pray when Jesus was praying, Peter would have made some better choices. Probably wouldn't have tried to cut somebody's head off. He probably wouldn't have needed as much correction as he got so many times. And we're the same. Our actions, our words, they affect people. We're talking about Halloween costumes. November 1st always reminds me, especially when it's the day after, well, when, when it's on a Sunday, when Halloween's been on the 31st, because I had a pastor who was preaching on November 1st, and he, I don't know what he was talking about. I don't remember anything except this incident. There was a young 20-something-year-old girl who, I mean, I had been going to this church for years. I had never seen her before, and she was there sitting next to her mom in church, and it wasn't like this big flamboyant, crazy Halloween costume, but she was wearing a Halloween costume. Now, she may have just stopped at grandma's or mom's the night before, decided to spend some time, watch a scary movie, and go to church with her in the morning. And this preacher started talking about stuff and he was saying, he was getting all wound up and he's saying all this stuff. And I don't, like I said, I don't remember the context, but he said something about, yeah, like showing up to church in a Halloween costume. Stupid. Those were his exact words. I never saw this girl in the church again. Our words have an effect. Even if it, well, for one, that was just, Plain old mean spirited. I can't believe that somebody would do that. But our words have an effect. Do you think about what you say before you say it? Do you pray about what you say before you pray it? Well, wait, that didn't make sense. Do you pray about what you're going to say before you say it? Peter was impulsive. What are we doing? I don't ever want to be the reason why somebody turns away from salvation because of the words I say, the actions I do, the infighting, whatever it is. I don't ever want to be the one pointing people away from Jesus, saying, you're not good enough. You're not clean enough. You're not ready. You are you did something dumb. You showed up in a Halloween costume. Peter was impulsive and almost took a life. But if he had just prayed, he could have participated and been there for his savior, his master, his teacher. And that brings us to the master, the teacher, Jesus. Verse 48. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out 
as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I love how calm Jesus was. He's just like, guys, what are you doing? I'm not some big, scary axe murderer. I'm the son of a carpenter. I'm the guy who's been peaceful, loving, compassionate. And here you are with clubs, swords, ready to get me. You've had plenty of time, plenty of opportunity. All this stuff isn't necessary. Even when the enemy fought dirty, bribing people, using as described during the time in the temple, saying we need to find some sort of trickery to catch him, getting false witnesses. Even when they were doing all this stuff, playing dirty, fighting dirty, Jesus said, I'm not going to resist. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stoop on your to your level. And that's the most important thing to get from here, right here. Get this. Jesus laid down his life. He didn't say, oh, well, you know, this fight, I can't, there's no way I can win this. I'm, I'm not going to just go along because I have no choice. Jesus gave his life. John 10, 17 through 18, Jesus says, I lay down my life. He said that no one takes this life away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. Jesus gave his life for us. He didn't have it taken. Verse 49 says, I was with you daily in the temple preaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. I got to do what I got to do. This is my father's plan. I got to do this. And the scriptures have already told about what was going to happen. There's hundreds of scriptures, mostly Old Testament. Well, obviously, mostly Old Testament, because it was the stuff before Jesus came, before he was born, the things that happened. A few of the a few of the hundreds of scriptures, Psalm 41, 19, or 41, 9. Even my close friends in whom I trusted, or my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Isaiah 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And he already quoted Ze Zechariah. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will sh strike, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. God's plan is perfect, even when we can't see it. Jesus responded according to to submission to the will of the Father. He's able to do that, able to respond properly and obey. Why? Yes, he's God, but he's God and man, which means he still has the same temptations that we all have. You can't say, oh, well, Jesus did it because he was perfect. Jesus prayed. He had just got done praying. He prayed. He became prayer. His, he made a habit of praying, getting time alone with his father, talking to him, yes, but listening. Is this what your plan is? Is this what you want from me? Is this the direction you want me to go? Please make it clear. Let me listen to what you say. Prayer was a priority for Jesus. Even though he would have liked a different outcome, he was obedient. He submitted. And then we have the disciples. Good old disciples. Verse 50. Then they all forsook him and fled. They ran away. They saved their own skin. They left the Lord to face what was going to happen next on his own. Only an hour ago, verse 27, Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. You're all going to take off. You're going to split. Even Peter, who said, never, oh, never, never, oh, never, I won't ever, even if I have to die. While Jesus led by the example of prayer, the disciples slept. Instead of praying that they wouldn't fall away, praying that they could be ready 
prayer ready Jesus, made him ready to take what was going to happen, to drink the cup which he was given. Lack of prayer left the disciples unequipped, weak and lacking, self-centered. I often wonder what would have happened if they had spent that hour in prayer instead of sleeping. If they had spent that time speaking to the Father, saying, God, Jesus warned us what would happen. How can we make this not happen? How can we stand firm, stand with our master? I wonder what they would have meant, what they would have witnessed, what they missed because they were unprepared. And there's one other key player in this. Verse six, or the, the sixth one is the young man. Verse 51 and 52. Now a certain young man followed him, having linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him and left the linen cloth, and, or, and he left the linen cloth and fled from, the, from there naked. You know, I've never heard a preacher talk about this part. That's the part that you just, you know, you, well, we don't need to talk about those two verses. We can just sort of pass over them, right? Who was this streaker? I wonder if this was the first recorded streaker. It's the first that's recorded in the Bible, right? Well, since Adam and Eve. But I wonder who he was. Do you ever wonder? Well, maybe you're not like me. I love studying and I love finding out this stuff. I've learned so much from taking time and reading the word and reading what people way smarter than me have figured it out. This, this naked dude is only mentioned in one gospel, the gospel of Mark. It's the only place we read about it. And there's a whole bunch of theories about who it might have been. It could have been just some bystander that was there. Could have been a follower of Jesus that was not mentioned before and didn't want to be mentioned by name. It could have been John, the brother of James. It could have been James, the brother of Jesus. That's what people were thinking, at least. Some of the theories. They think that it could have been Lazarus. But the most common belief is that it was John Mark. You remember that name? John Mark? If you were with us in the beginning of this whole series in the book of Mark, John Mark is the author of the book of Mark. Could have been him. It's believed that the upper room where Jesus met with his disciples and had that meal was in his house. And that Judas probably brought this group, this mob, with him because the last place he had seen him was in the upper room. And Mark probably got roused from, from his sleep. Had somebody show up at the door unexpectedly. Like I had this morning when somebody thought it was time for church at 9 o'clock because they forgot to change their clock. <laughs> Fortunately, I was dressed. But <laughs> this was the middle of the night. This group shows up. You guys can grab the first thing you can find. It was a sheet or whatever, some linen. He threw it around himself. And they left. They didn't find Jesus there. So they left. And he didn't even give it a thought. He probably either, if he wasn't forced to go with, he went along just to see what was going to happen and to watch what was happening. He was roused awake, threw on a sheet, and followed along. And in this chaos, he of watching everything, he was almost caught. They went, because those disciples must have been pretty quick because they took off, and here's this poor guy in a sheet thinking, oh, nobody would notice me or whatever, and the, they tried to grab him. And he's like, oh, okay, I better get out of here too. I don't care about my sheet or anything. I'm getting out of here. I'm just streaking out. He took off. Maybe it was our author. It doesn't say. But what's the point about his inclusion. If it is Mark, he's admitting, yep, I called them out for what they did. I took off too. I, I let fear overcome me. I didn't stand there with the Savior. I went too. There's a 
Great comparison, though. Either way, there's a comparison here. Jesus got left completely alone. He might have been the one giving the account, but Jesus was left completely alone. This is the point that he wants you to see. Jesus was left alone, alone facing his captors, alone on trial, alone he was mocked and beaten, alone he laid down his life, all for you and me, all for you and me, so that we would never be left alone. The young man who was stripped is a great contrast. He fled to save himself. He was stripped, he fled to save himself. Jesus was seized and later stripped as well, stripped of his clothing, but he refused to flee. Didn't give up, didn't get out of there, didn't, he laid down his life. He saw his task through to completion, even when all the followers exposed their true human nature save your own skin. Jesus still loved them, still obeyed the Father, still laid down his life. Even when we're at our worst, when we're at our ugliest, Jesus knew about it. Even when we're at our most undeserving, Jesus knew what was gonna happen and he still laid down his life for you. He knew about you. He laid down his life for you and paid for your sins with his life. So there's five different people group or people in one group. Six different responses to the situation. I'm continually amazed by Jesus. The one who is blameless and innocent. All powerful. Laid down his life. Matthew tells us that Jesus said, I could call down 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels. I could call them down and wipe you guys out, but I'm not doing it. When faced with hate, his response was still love, still obedient to the Father, still his first priority was our reconciliation. I'm working on it. I'm trying to be like Jesus, trying to respond like Jesus, but it takes time. It takes prayer. I have to do the thing that Jesus has done. Pray, pray, pray. I need more Jesus in me all the time, every day. The world responds today. The world has been responding since then. Most of the time we see them turning away from Jesus, thinking that they can do things their own way. They, they can draft their own version of the truth, whatever fits them. Sin, oh, and that's, that's just, maybe that's bad for somebody else, but if I don't have a guilty conscience about it, I'm okay. Are you deserting Jesus whenever the situation gets uncomfortable? Six days a week, we desert him and we show up on Sunday and we're super Christian or we check online and we're oh yeah, amen, I'll, I'll type in amen all day long but the rest of the week deserting him our words matching Jesus, our choices the choices that he would make is he really Lord of your life so often it's easy. We can we love to acknowledge Jesus as our Savior. Yeah, Jesus saved me. Hey, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus saved me. Hey, Amen. But is he Lord? Is he just our get out get out of jail free card, or is he Lord? Where do you stand? Lord calls for obedience. Matthew seven twenty two through twenty three. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 1 John 2, 4 says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Oh, 
obedience is the difference between being a born, true born again believer and a make believer. Jesus is more than just our Savior. He is our Savior. If we accept the free gift that he has forgiven our sins. If he's forgiven our sins and he's paid that price, we should respond in love. We should respond by wanting to do the things that he's done, not doing the things that upset him, not doing the things that make him sad, not doing the things that hurt him, not deserting him. Can we say that he is Lord? <coughs> You may have said that prayer way back when, oh Jesus, please come into my heart. Be my savior. Save me from fire and brimstone. But have you ever said, Jesus, be my Lord. I give ownership of my heart. I don't just give a place in my heart where I made a little bit of space for you. I give you ownership of my heart today. Whether you're five years old or 150 years old. It doesn't matter. You can say that now and start. The, the disciples, the ones that deserted him, they came back eventually and they, they got it right. Don't let it be too late because I don't want you to have to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Didn't I? Didn't I? Didn't I go? I did all these nice things for wonderful people and I I ran errands for people. I picked up, I made chicken noodle soup when somebody was sick. I did this. I brought somebody to church. I and have God say, that's great. I didn't know you. God, we thank you for how you responded that even when the outcome was scary and painful and you had to experience, Jesus had to experience such difficulty, such pain, such betrayal, not just the pain of physical, but knowing that even when he was going to lay down his life, there was a world that was going to not choose him, not accept him, not love him, not serve him. Lord, let us not be like that. Lord, I pray that we make you Lord every day, continually, every day, responding to what you did, your love, laying down your life for us by making you Lord of our lives. Praising in Jesus' name, amen.